and the whole market sort of collapses that way. Um, and it was that sort of a quote-unquote death spiral that uh, we were really afraid of um, when Obama set up the Health Insurance Act. Because they were afraid that if you didn't force everyone to buy insurance, no one, uh, that, that the whole market would collapse because the prices would keep rising higher and higher. Um, another example of this is so-called Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law says that um, if you have two different currencies, one which is like doesn't actually have that much gold in it, and one which has a lot of gold in it, and they're either it's either legally required that you you uh, use those as the same, or people just can't tell them apart very easily, right? Um, that corresponds to the case where you can't tell how sick someone is, or you're not allowed to price based on how sick they are. Um, then everybody ends up keeping the gold currency at home because it's super valuable, and then using the crappy currency to transact in the marketplace. And so that having that bad money around drives the good money out of the marketplace. Um, and this is a major fear that motivated the, um, the mandatory insurance that uh, was mandated under the Obama plan. And, and David, how could we uh, graphically represent this in terms of cost curves, a, a death spiral? Um, well, so you have, uh, I guess you would have decreasing, or you, I guess you would have increasing costs because as you sort of try to increase the number, when you try to increase the price, you have to, I guess it would be decreasing that, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. It's decreasing because as you, try, as you try to increase the price, fewer and fewer people are willing to actually purchase your product. That's right. But as we saw on the earlier slide, we can have decreasing costs without a death spiral, right? right? So this case was decreasing costs, but there was an equilibrium. So in what case would we get a death spiral? Um, well, obviously, if you can't find the equilibrium. That's um, right. So what, what, when would that happen? Think, think about the logic we were going through. I was saying, at, when there's this many people in the market, the cost of covering them is higher. Then you raise the price, still the cost of covering them is higher. When you raise the price, still the cost of covering them is higher. Okay. When, when, when could that happen? Would it have to do with the way demand, the demand curve is structured? Or is it purely based on... Well, it's, it's both. It's about the relationship between the demand and the Okay, cost. so it's like what we were saying about the equilibrium or stability condition. Yeah. So it has to be that the demand curve has to cut from... If it doesn't cut from above, then you can't find the equilibrium. Yeah, that, that's, that's, very, that's very close to right. So what, what, I, what I would say is the simplest case is just that the average cost curve is always above the demand curve, right? Okay. Because I said, imagine these many people in the market. Well, the average cost of covering them is above that. Okay, so then we charge that price. Well, then the average cost of then these many people in the market, and the average cost of covering is still above that. As long as the average cost curve is always above the demand curve, you get this death spiral, right? But the marginal cost curve could well be below that. And so it could be socially optimal to cover everyone, and yet it could be impossible to cover anyone. Um, another, on the other hand, we could have an advantageous selection, in which case the cost curves slope up. Right? In that case, the marginal cost curve is above the average cost curve. And we actually have too much insurance rather than too little, or too many loans rather than too few. <coughs> okay, so selection is thus the slope of the cost curve, and we know that we can recover the slope of the cost curve, that the slope of the cost curve gives us the difference between the average and marginal cost curve, and so it gives us the wedge. So if we can measure the amount of selection, right, we can also measure the distortion created by selection. Um, and this is exactly what Laurent Inov and co-authors did in uh, 2010. Uh, we studied this in lecture three, but I want to come back to it. So what they did is they um, had a large uh, aluminum manufacturer who offered two different types of health plans. The first was like very minimal. It was basically like hardly any insurance. It was just a very low coverage plan. Um, and the second uh, plan was quite comprehensive. It offered a lot of insurance. And individual uh, division managers 
got to choose the uh, prices that they offered to their particular group division for these two different insurance things. They claim that these division managers basically chose these things randomly. It's a little bit questionable whether that's really the case, but if it is true, then that gives us random variation in price that lets us get different fractions of the population covered, and then we can just look at how many people in that part of the population, sorry, in that division, end up, up getting how sick, how costly was it to cover those people under the plans, right? And um, we can thus measure the average cost of the claimants and draw out the average cost curve. And then we can use this, the slope of this, to determine where the marginal cost curve is and determine the distortion. Um, and of course, the size of the distortion depends not only on the cost curve, but also on the demand curve. The demand curve is completely inelastic. There would be no distortion regardless. The demand curve is very flat, and there can be a huge distortion, even from a small change between those two. Okay, so here's exactly what they did. Um, what they did is they looked at different divisions, places where different prices were charged. So in this division, this price was charged. In this division, this price was charged. In this division, this price was charged, and so forth. And then they figured out how many people chose to purchase. So here's the fraction chose choosing to purchase at the different prices. Then, for each one of these dots, where there is a certain fraction that chose to purchase, they measured through uh, you know, auditing the insurer what the average claims were for insurance for those people. So that's this dot here for this one, this dot here for this one, and so forth. And then they just drew this marginal cost line through that, uh, and the, uh, average cost line through that, and then they took the derivative of that, and that gave them the marginal cost curve. And so, where was the distortion from adverse selection? Well, if you have this marginal cost curve, and these white dots represent the demand curve, uh, they chose to draw, draw a line through this to like this, this point here. So that would leave this triangle here. I think it looks a little bit more concave, so I would have said it looks like that. And then it would be this little area here. Right? That's exactly the distortion from adverse selection, because here was the intersection between demand and uh, average cost. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, uh. How does the selection stuff for like some monopolies that you said in your like, in which cases are monopolies like in circumstances where there's adverse or advantageous selection? You mean if you had a monopolist and selection at the same time? Yeah, I'm just trying to see how like the second half of the selection, like the selection part, reflects like the, or. Re well, so the, my point was that. What, what, what we did in the first part of the lecture, right, was analyze the distortions that come from forcing someone to price at average cost. Yeah. And we said that that can arise not just because of a regulation, but because of market forces. And now we're looking at the distortions that show up in a market where average cost pricing arises because of market forces rather than because of, yeah. Okay. So that's it. So um, I'm going to, you guys should fill these out. You should give them to Siraj. Uh, he will bring them back to Robert. Uh, and good luck on the problem set. We, we've got extra time now, so I'm very happy to take questions from people. But you can just come up here and ask me.